Ruby Frankie and Jody Hildebrandt were just sentenced yesterday, and a very stark difference between Ruby Frankie's statement to the court and Jody Hildebrandt's statement to the court. And we're going to jump into that in just one second. But first, let's discuss why the sentencing hearing even has to occur. After all, we all know that a plea agreement was entered into, and if a plea agreement was entered into, which specifically says in the plea agreement what the plea is going to be, and even what the sentence is going to be. It says that straight out in the plea agreement. Well, if that's the case, what is this whole purpose of having a sentencing hearing, and having statements, and having the judge pretend like he's deciding what the sentence is? It's all written straight out in the plea agreement, isn't it? And the judge even signed that plea agreement. Well, not necessarily. Because we know that there's a separation of powers here. The prosecutor cannot decide about what the sentence is going to be. They can decide what cases to prosecute, but they can't decide about what the sentence is going to be. The judge cannot decide which cases to prosecute, but the judge can decide what the sentence is going to be. So the prosecutor and the parole board could make recommendations and suggestions to the judge about what they feel the sentence should be, but the judge is not bound by the prosecutor to adopt those recommendations and suggestions. He can completely deviate and decide what he wants. He can decide that the prosecutor got this all wrong, and it's not enough to just impose the sentence that the prosecutor is recommend, rec recommending. The, the judge actually has to, he's going to feel, he may feel, that I have to impose a much stricter sentence. So the judge by no means is ever required or bound by the prosecutor's recommendations and suggestions. So then what is the judge signing, out, signing off on with this plea agreement? All the judge is doing is when he signs that, he's just letting them know that he feels that this plea was entered into freely, knowingly, and voluntarily. And that's what the judge has to just make sure. He's not in any way, by signing that paper, adopting what the prosecutor is saying. All he's saying is that this plea appears to me that it was freely given, knowingly given, and voluntarily entered into. And therefore, the judge is not bound by it. So, although in 90% of the cases, the judge is going to adopt the recommendation of the prosecutor, he's by no means bound by it. And the reason why the judge will 90% of the times adopt the recommendation of the prosecutor and not deviate, even though he's completely allowed to under the separation of powers, but in order to encourage and incentivize defendants to admit to their crimes and enter into plea agreements with the prosecutor. So the judge is not going to want to disturb that and start imposing much stricter sentences than the prosecutor is recommending because then people are not going to be interested in entering, entering into plea agreements because, you know, the prosecutor has, has no sway with the judge. The judge just does what he wants anyway. So it's going to incentivize people not to enter into plea agreements. So that's why 90% of the time, the judge will adopt the sentencing recommendation by the prosecutor. And that is exactly what happened in this case. The recommendation by the prosecutor was in the plea agreement that, and by the parole board also, that uh, the Ruby Frankie and Jody Hildebrandt, and they were the, exactly the same type of plea agreement. They pled to the same exact charges and the same exact sentences that they were going to, I mean, they were, they were charged with six charges of child abuse, and they were pleading, they were pleading guilty to four of them. So they were dropping two charges and pleading to four of them. And even in the plea agreement, they agreed that the there will be a prison term, and the prison term will run consecutively. So they will run consecutively of each other and not concurrently. So this is also a question that you have to analyze under the statute, which the judge did, which we're going to get to in one minute. But the first thing is that they have already agreed, Jody Hildebrandt and Ruby Frank already agreed that they're going to serve consecutive, uh, consecutive terms because of these charges that they're pleading guilty to. And now it's just the fact of whether the judge is going to say, okay, yes, and even I'm going to sentence you even stricter than that, perhaps. You know, maybe, he, maybe he'll do that. But that was what they were agreeing to in this plea agreement. And the judge, like we said, unsurprisingly, did follow the prosecutor's recommendation, but he st still had to analyze it under the statute because he's not bound by it. And in fact, just 
to make things even more clear, this specific idea was actually in the plea agreement, that the judge is not bound by what's incorporated in the plea agreement. This is what it says. It says this is straight out from the plea agreement. In bold, trial judge not bound. I know that any charge or sentencing concession or recommendation of probation or suspended sentence, including a reduction of the charges for sentencing made or sought by either defense counsel or the prosecuting attorney are not binding on the judge. So it's not binding on the judge. So, and then finally, I also know that any opinions they express to me as to what they believe the judge may do are not binding on the judge. So there you go. It's straight black and white that whatever's in this plea agreement is not is not binding on the judge. And therefore, the judge did have to analyze this, uh, the sentence, under the uh, relevant statute, which was 76-3-401. Uh, and this dealt, this deals with consecutive versus concurrent sentences. So the, char the sentence for aggravated child abuse, each one is 1 to 15 years. And they're playing to four of them. So 1 to 15 years times 4, that should be what the charge is. And that's why some of the outlets, some of the news outlets and some other channels perhaps were saying that the maximum that Ruby Frankie is facing and Jody Hildebrand is facing is 60 years. But, of course, all of my intelligent subscribers and viewers who have been following me with the Ruby Frankie case already know that that's incorrect. Because my last video already explained straight out of the statute that when you're serving consecutive terms, it's never going to aggravate more than 30 years. There are going to be some circumstances not relevant to this case, but generally speaking, when a defendant is serving consecutive terms, it's never going to be more than 30 years in prison. So the ultimate question is, how? what's the maximum that Ruby Frankie and Jody Hildman are facing? The answer to that is 30 years, not 60 years, which is why you're much more intelligent, you're much more well-informed because you're tuning in to my channel. And therefore, if you haven't yet, please subscribe, like the video so we can continue bringing this message to you and to others. So the, the maximum here is 30 years. The minimum here is four years. And then the judge did analyze, and there's just, uh, he did have to analyze this under the statute about whether he should impose consecutive or concurrent sentences. Even though, again, in the plea agreement, it says that she's, that Jody and Ruby are both agreeing to serve consecutive sentences, but the judge can deviate. So the judge did uh, analyze it under the statute, and the statute says straight out the following. In determining whether state offenses are to run concurrently or consecutively, the court shall consider the gravity and circumstances of the offenses, the number of victims, and the history, character, and rehabilitative needs of the defendant. And certainly in this case, if it's a grieve charge, if it's the gravity, the circumstances of the offenses, and by all means, in, in this case, obviously, it's obvious that the type of torture that these poor kids had to endure certainly rises to the level that the statute requires for uh, there to be consecutive sentences. And that's why the judge, after analyzing it on the statute, said, yes, we are going to uh, give sentence Jody and, and, um, and Ruby, Frankie, to four consecutive uh, sentences for their crimes. So this, then let's get into some of the statements that Ruby Frankie made. And Jody Hildebrandt was really just said one or two sentences. She loves the children, something like that. And Ruby Frankie really gave much more of uh, a longer uh, speech. And really she, it seems much seemed that she's really speaking from the heart. And it looked like she really was filled with remorse, and she f seemed like she felt sorry. She, fe she, she seemed like she really realized what happened to her, that she was under the influence of uh, Jody Hildebrand, and that's why she did all these terrible things uh, with her. And she's realizing all this now, and she genuinely appears to be remorseful and sorry for what happened. Did that make a difference to the judge? No, because of the, you know, and so some people may be wondering, and this could be a part of a, of a moral debate about what happens when you have a person and let's say you're the judge and you see that this person was very clearly under the influence of somebody else. And that's why they committed these crimes. What should you do? What type of sentence should you impose? 
Should you impose a sentence that just strict by the letter of the law and you just ignore any influence that the person had in their life to cause them to do this, to do this crime or not? And the general approach to this, the general approach, and some people will feel, well, if you're under the, you know, some, some people are very charismatic and they can convince you of things. And even if you're a healthy person, but once you get under their spell, you may start doing things. And therefore, maybe we should have a little more mercy on you, as opposed to somebody who just wakes up on, in, 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 the, in, in a bright, a regular day and just decides to commit crimes. Shouldn't we feel more sorry for the person who's under the influence of somebody else? And the general approach to this, under the law, is that if you are essentially a healthy person, you don't have any major psychological problems or psychiatric problems, you're... Uh, uh, in general, before this all happened, you were a healthy person, by all accounts. And you became under the influence of somebody. You still had many choices and many steps that led you to eventually commit a crime. It doesn't happen the next day. You don't just become enamored with somebody and become under their influence and under their control, and the next day you're committing crimes. It's a process. And usually throughout that process, you have a lot of warning signs and a lot of red flags. And you must ignore them in order to continue following this influencer down this road, which will eventually lead you to commit some of these crimes. And therefore, the law generally does not have mercy when it looks at this type of situation. Somebody who, after all this time, can say, look, I didn't realize the influence. You know what? Something that she actually admitted to when she was, this is Ruby Franken, when she was speaking giving her statement, she was saying how all her family was trying to get her out of this influence. And they were, and she was just being nasty to them and distancing herself from them. So you've got your family trying to, trying to help you, trying to get you out of this influence. And you on your own are thinking that you're better than everybody. And you don't need to listen to every, anybody. You just need to follow your influencer and do whatever she's telling you to do. Even if that means destroy your 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 marriage, destroy your relationship with your children, destroy your relationship with your parents, your in-laws, your friends, your sisters, your brothers. There's so many red flags here that the person should have realized before they ended up committing that crime. And that's why, generally speaking, the judge, I mean, this is not the only reason, but the the judge and the law will not have mercy on somebody who just says that, look, feel bad for me, I was under the influence of this person. Now, can that help in terms of getting her out early, yes. Because when she goes in front of the parole board and she says that she realizes what happened and she realizes her mistake and she's remorseful and she's sorry and she's working on herself and, and to make sure that she's not going to burn these bridges and to, not, and to, to reconnect with family and listen to all these, you know, all these warnings. So then she's not such a danger to the community anymore. And therefore, she has rehabilitated. She's become uh, more healthy throughout this process, and therefore she should be let out early. And for perhaps for Jody, which didn't seem that she was that much remorseful, and she didn't seem to have said as much as Ruby Frankie, could be that she's not going to get out as fast as Ruby Frankie. So it will help, I think, in the long run that she's realizing her issues, but in terms of the sentencing, just the strict letter of the law of sentencing, the judge is not going to have any more mercy on her than Jody Hildebrand. And that's what we found today, that she, they were sentenced to the same exact, uh, same exact sentence. Now, I just want to mention a remark that Ruby Frankie made. And I know it's not really the, doesn't have such a great feeling to wax poetic about what, what a defendant, somebody who tortured their children uh, in a concentration camp type of setting, you know, wax poetic about what she said during her sentencing. But this is really a thought that's really uh, spoken about in many other books, uh, psychology books, certainly religious books. And it's, I think it's an interesting concept to think about, and I just want to bring it to my viewers' attention. And I thought that this was the most profound part of what she said during her, her statement, Ruby Frankie, that is. She said the following. She said when she was arrested, she said, the moment, the moment she was handcuffed, now I'm gonna, I'll say the exact quote, the moment she handcuffed me 
was the moment I gained my freedom. And of course, in this situation, just simply looking at that statement, it's true because she was under the influence of Jody Hildebrand. She was convincing her to do all these terrible things, horrific things to her children. And now that she's being able to take, be taken away from that influence, so now that's really when, really when she gained her freedom from Jody. So even though, you know, it's kind of like she was under the influence of Jody, and now that we handcuffed her and dragged her away and put her in a different type of imprisonment, but that really was freedom from Jody. So that's, I think, the simple of what she was saying. But really, this concept can be, can be applied much more broadly and really to every single person's life. You know, what is freedom? What is freedom? Is freedom being able to live without any restrictions, without any control, without any sort of discipline? Is that what real freedom tastes like? Or is that actually not freedom? That's really not freedom. That's not what freedom feels like. In fact, you may be even more enslaved to your impulses and your urges and whatever you feel. So which one is more an enslavement? Are you more enslaved when you just have no boundaries, no restrictions, no sense of self-discipline, no sense of morals? Or do you actually have more freedom by the fact that you do exhibit a certain amount of self-control, a certain amount of self-discipline, and a certain amount of morals? And that's, I think, an important message that she actually uh, said today. And I think, you know, being a religious person myself, I, I appreciated it, even though, again, I'm not saying it's, I'm not, I'm not saying it's her idea. This idea already has been spoken about in uh, way before her, but I thought it was a nice point to bring out to my subscribers and viewers. And that will be it for today. That's my reaction on the Ruby Frankie and Jody Hildebrand uh, sentencing. Please, if you haven't liked, subscribe, like this video, and we will see you next time.